Good afternoon. I'm Tim Ringo, author, board advisor, and conference speaker on subjects related to workplace and workplace transformation. And I'm delighted to be here this afternoon to talk about my next installment, my most recent installment in Tim Talks. This Tim Talk focuses on current and future workplace trends and those that you should be watching out for. So we're going to talk about things that are sort of here and what's coming, and we're going to talk about how you might be able to take advantage of these trends. So let's get started. So first of all, I know we don't like talking about COVID-19. I certainly don't. Uh, it's in the rearview mirror, thank goodness, but it has had a huge impact on the workplace. And it's been one of those crises, at least the first in my 35 years uh, in my career, where it was a crisis that actually helped the workplace. It put us on a different track and one that's actually better than we were on before, which is why it makes it interesting. And it's continuing to have these impacts two years later. So let's take a look at these. A lot of these um, trends that I'm gonna talk to you about were kind of already happening, right, before the pandemic, but they've been accelerated. And I think accelerated in a very positive way. So let's see what you think. So the first one is HR takes center stage. So if you think back to the 2008, 2010 financial crisis, it was really the CFO that needed to step up, right? It was a financial crisis. They need to engineer financially how to get out of that. When you get to this pandemic crisis, it was a people crisis. And it was the opportunity for HR to step up, right? To step up and be the heroes like the CFOs were back in 2010. And they did. You know, reporting in, in the time that I spend kind of traveling the world speaking and speaking to senior executives, everyone seems to say, gosh, you know, HR did a fantastic job keeping us productive, keeping us safe helping us uh, work from home, things that, that, that we needed to be able to work effectively. And I think there's a spotlight now on HR, and that's both a positive thing, but it's also a bit daunting, right? Because now it's time to perform, and, and I see it wherever I go around the world. HR organizations are stepping up and taking advantage of this opportunity to continue to be center stage and get investment in technology, get investment in transforming HR. And this is very positive for the workplace going forward. The next uh, trend, and you will have seen this and been thinking about it. It was already happening again before the pandemic, but it was accelerated and it continues to be with us today, which is this whole idea of hybrid working and flexible working, right? So this idea of being able to work at home some days, work in the office some days, and even some people have chosen to work less days in the week, three or four days rather than five. And this was um, something that, that really, when it happened during the pandemic, people got used to this idea of hybrid working and being able to work from home. And over and over again, we're seeing more and more data that's coming in and it says that has helped people be more engaged with work. It helps them balance that kind of, you know, the work and the life and, you know, the home life sort of things. And people are finding that it's a very good way to work. Now, there's a lot of challenges with it. And some organizations are even saying, hey, all of you, it's time to get back into the office. But people are resisting that. And I think what we're seeing is there's starting to be a bit of a balance now where it's okay for some people to work uh, some of the time at home. And I think that's a very positive trend and something that's helped tremendously in terms of people's ability to uh, engage with their work and improve their performance. The next one is workplace culture. So before the pandemic, there was an epidemic, and that pun is intended, there was an epidemic of something we call presenteeism, right? Where people are staying at the office from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. because the boss does that, right? And you probably remember this. This was a, a bit of an epidemic in the UK and in Europe and across the US and Asia. Um, and because so many of us started working from home during the pandemic, bosses and managers didn't have their team with them all the time. And they actually kind of got used to that. And they, they, they saw that people could be away from the office and be just as productive, if not more productive. And so they're more comfortable with their people not actually being in the office every day. So we're starting to see the death of presenteeism where people are just being in the office because the boss was there. That is not productive time. That's not good for you in terms of your mental and physical health. And I think this is a great... Uh, bad habit that we've broken uh, on the other side of the pandemic, and long may it last. The next one is workforce well-being, which kind of builds on that, right? So there was already a doubling of investment in workforce well-being before the pandemic. It's now quadrupled since then. But people saw during the pandemic how important it was to make sure that people are physically well, mentally well, also financially well. There's a lot of discussion about, about you know, living wage and that sort of thing but also other aspects of wellness, which is the kind of chair you sit in and the kind of PC that you work on. And, and people are realizing these are really important in terms of people's uh, engagement and performance at work, that, that a well worker uh, is one that can do more and is happier at work, and this is a good thing. So again, this is continuing to be something we're seeing post-pandemic, 
that's a very positive trend, that we see more focus and investment. The next one is workforce diversity. Again, this has been something that's been around for 20 years now, right? But we saw during the pandemic a real emphasis on, you know, and making it okay in terms of different genders, different color of skin, even different brains, right? So people who are neurodiverse. Um, we're seeing a big trend towards how do you hire uh, and how do you attract people uh, with different brains who have neurodiverse uh, conditions who actually bring something to work that, that, that you know, many other people can't bring. So there's a, an effort to sort of bring these kinds of things into the, into the workplace diversity culture. And I think it's a very, very positive development and uh, continues to accelerate uh, after the pandemic. The next one is employee experience. And really this gets, I think, more, less about the physical space that you're working in, but is more about sort of the technological experience that you're having. A lot of senior executives in the past five or six years or so have been saying, look, the technology we're using is all about process and compliance. It's not about making people better. You know, you can hear CEOs saying, I want technology in the workplace that's gonna be about making people better. I want intelligent technology, I want easy to use technology, I want consumer grade technology. Because if you think about it, at home, the technology we use is very easy and makes us very good at buying things, right? And so CEOs are saying, why don't we have that at work? And they're, they're pushing the software vendors to say, you know, look, quit with these boring types of technologies, make the technology more interactive, make it more about um, helping somebody perform higher in their job. And we're seeing a whole sort of focus on this kind of employee technological experience that's already kind of then integrated with your personal space, whether that be at home or in the office or both. And again, I think this is a very powerful trend to make technology about making people better rather than making it about compliance. The next one, and this has been something that, that I've been talking about for years really, which is I've always hated that term big data, right? Big data, well, what does that mean? I mean, if, if you're an employee and HR says to you, we've got big data on you, that doesn't make you feel very good, right? You kind of wonder, well, what, what's that mean, right? And, and the other aspect of big data is if you have big data, you actually have nothing, right? What you want is your HR uh, department to have smart data, you know, to have small data that's very specific that's gonna help you be better at your job, right? So it's all about people analytics uh, or you know, insightful data, smart data that, that helps the HR organization make you better at work. And that's what you want. You don't want big data, you want smart data, which is usually small data uh, and insightful data. And then lastly, there was a lot of talk during the, uh, the pandemic and, and concern about, well, how is the fact that people are disrupted in their, in their work, how's that gonna impact the already difficult situation of, of declining people productivity around the world? Well, guess what? We're on the other side of the pandemic, and for the first time in 10 years, we're actually starting to see people, people productivity is going up in almost all regions of the world, even in the UK, where it's been stagnant for nearly 10 years. And really, if you take all the previous trends I just talked about, those are inputting into, that's how we're getting more productivity from people. People are getting more engaged with their work and they're able to do, uh, perform higher than they were before the pandemic. So solving the productivity puzzle, which is the name of one of my most recent books, was actually, actually written before the pandemic. But a lot of these, these trends have come along to help actually improve people productivity. And long may that last because we need it. So that's kind of the trends that have been emerging and are continuing to be accelerated uh, in the past year or so. Let's talk about some things that are a little bit further out, but not too far out. These things are coming quickly, and I wanna walk you through some things that you should be thinking about. So first of all, I hope I'm that person in the top left when I'm 90 years old, so uh, be able to be that fit. Uh, maybe not the headband, I'm not so fond of headbands, but uh, uh, I would hope to be as fit as, as that man. But there's a serious point here which is that for the first time, so January, sorry, June 2020, for the first time in, in human history, we had six uh, demographics in the workforce at once. We had six generations, right? And that's because the over 70s are now a large enough block of people in work um, that you can actually call it a generation at work. Before it was quite small, less than 10%. Now it's getting close to 15 or 20%, depending on on the, the country you live in, but it's growing very fast. And it's a really simple reason, two reasons why it's growing fast. One, people are far healthier at 70 years old today than they were in my parents' generation and my grandparents' generation. So they're able to work. The second one is many of them have to work because it's very expensive uh, to retire. But people who are in their sort of 60s and 70s who would ordinarily be retired under the kind of old definition of retire, well, a lot of them are doing something called pro-retirement, right? 
where they're saying like, I wanna work, but I wanna work the hours I wanna work. I wanna work for the boss that I wanna work. I'm gonna do the things that I wanna do and that I can add value. And so it's up to organizations to try to figure out how to use this older generation to bring in their skills and capabilities. But it's not easy to recruit somebody who's 70 year, years old. You need to think about, you know, they're not that interested in money. They're more interested in who they work for and what they do. And they might need things like a bigger screen to help with eyesight and things like that. Even though we are a bit healthier, uh, quite a bit healthier than, than we were back in the, in the day, there's still things that age is gonna always have an impact. So leverage that sixth generation of workforce because older people bring a lot into, into the organization. And I tell you what, wherever I go in the world, young people want to go to older people to learn stuff. They would much rather do that than go to a training course, right? So this, this sixth generation is very important going forward. The next trend that's continuing at a pace, which is this feminization of work, uh, which I'm a big fan of. When I worked at Accenture, I was a senior executive in Accenture, it was a very male sort of dominated culture. And then when I got recruited to IBM in, 20, in 2006, uh, IBM was a completely different kind of company for me because there were lots of women in senior positions. In fact, Ginny Rometty, who was uh, my boss when I was uh, at IBM back in the day, is currently the chairman of IBM um, and was the first CEO and chairman who was female. So, but the thing about IBM had a, had a more female culture. I always found there were better decisions, there were better outcomes, there was better meetings uh, that you would have. Um, and so I'm a big fan, I'm not a sociologist, I don't understand all the insides of this, but I just find that workplaces that um, are increasing in feminization are higher uh, productive, more engaging workplaces. Um, and I've seen that in my own experience, that's continuing to go forward. The next trend that's coming in, it's kind of already here and it's been getting a lot of, uh, lot of play in really the past 12 months, which is artificial intelligence. Sometimes I think it gets overplayed a little bit um, that we might be expecting a little bit more from AI than we can deliver at the moment. But the really important thing that you need to know about now is it is coming and it's gonna get cleverer and cleverer very quickly. And the thing not to worry about is the technology so much because most organizations look at how they harness it for people to make them better at their jobs, right? Rather than use the technology to replace. I think there's a trend now which saying, no, let's, let's use this technology to make people better which actually gets to a point that I think is the most important thing to think about right now, which is that those that use AI the best are those that ask it the right questions. So a skill that humans are gonna to have to learn are two, is twofold. One, learning how to ask the AI the right question. Young people are particularly good at this because you, you get a better answer and outcome. The second thing, humans are always, at least for the, for the foreseeable future, going to need to take what the AI is saying and apply judgment and creativity to it, right? Just taking what the AI says and say, okay, let's do that, that's not how it should work. Humans should be looking at it and saying, does that really make sense? Couldn't we do it slightly differently, right? And bring that kind of creativity. So humans harnessing AI is gonna be very, very powerful. Um, and this is a trend that you need to get ready for. We don't need to be afraid of it. We need to figure out how to harness it and we need to figure out how to build the skills to use it effectively. And that's the important thing. The next trend, and it's one I alluded to earlier, which is this idea that a lot of organizations are starting to actively recruit people with neurodiverse conditions. So people with ADHD, dyscalculia, um, autism, as or sometimes called Asperger's syndrome. Um, they're actively recruiting these people because it's really interesting when you think about it. Um, these people are usually people who can bring different brain to a problem. And they tend to have a different way of looking at things. So, you can see here on the slide, these are some gentlemen from my hometown of Dayton, Ohio. Uh, this is Wilbur and Orville Wright. And you can see they're sitting in one of their early airplanes. And this is at the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the 20th century. And they were very interesting individuals, these two, because they never finished school. Um, neither of them married. Um, they were both very, very focused and actually world famous before they ever learned to fly. They had invented something called the Wright bicycle. It was a Wright cycle. And it was a bicycle that everybody around the world wanted. So they were already world famous, world traveled, very wealthy. By the time they had decided that they got tired with the whole bicycle business and sold it. And they said, right, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go learn how to, how to build an airplane and actually get it to fly. They knew nothing about it. They knew nothing about the engineering of flight. But they spent six months in the Smithsonian learning everything they could learn about the engineering and the physics of flight. And at that time, about 1900, people had basically were giving up because 
people would get the airplane up and then it would crash, right? But they had sort of thought that, well, lift hasn't been solved. Wilbur and Orville came to a different conclusion. They actually found that the lift was solved underneath the plane. The issue was the control of the plane. That's why they have these sticks in their hands. They invented this idea of wing warping, which allowed them to control the plane when it went up. And that was what ultimately fixed the problem. And they were able to solve the problem in less than three years. People have been trying for over a century to do it. They solved it in less than three years. And most people are certain now, a lot of people who study these two, they're almost certain that they were autistic. Um, and they couldn't get on at school. They couldn't learn in a, in a way that other people did. But they had their own way of learning and their own way of doing things. And they were able to solve this problem uh, mainly because they had different brains. Um, and they were able to come at the problem from a different perspective. These are very valuable people in your organization. So that's why I say, you know, look for innovation by employing people with neurodiverse uh, conditions. The next one is one that people always ask me. They say, Tim, so where do you, where, what do you think is going to be the most important capability, the most important sort of thing HR is going to do in the near future? And I always say the same thing. It's strategic workforce planning. Right people, right place, right time, right skills, right motivation. That is what HR's job is about, right? But we are not very good at that. And this is something we have to get a lot better at, right? So this whole idea of strategic workforce planning, right people, right place, right time, right skills, right motivation. And this has got three, three pieces to it. First of all, it's a mindset, right? That leadership understand that that's what we're about. And, and that's what leadership should be seeing in terms of how they manage people. It should be giving people the opportunity to succeed by being in the right place at the right time with the right skills. The second bit of it is the processes that allow you to do that. And then lastly, the technology. And the technology is becoming much better, much more clever and intelligent actually in helping the organization figure out how do you get those people in the right place, right time, right skills, right motivation. So for me, when people ask me what's the most important capability for the workplace and for HR going forward. It's strategic workforce management. And lastly, we're gonna end on the subject that we talked about briefly, but again, I'm a big uh, proponent of this idea that we need to use te digital technology. We need to harness digital technology to allow us to perform better at work, allow us to serve customers better, uh, allow us to build machines better, all the things that we do at work we should use the technology and harness it, make humans better. And we should think about it at home. Again, as I said before, we're very good at using digital technology at home. We should be able to do the same things in the workplace. And this is gonna help us solve the productivity puzzle where we've seen productivity going down for years. It's now on the upward trend now, but this is gonna be a big part of it, which is how we use technology going forward to make us better. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the talk. This is me, you can see my email my website, you can see my latest book, Solving the Productivity Puzzle there. If you wanna zap those QR codes, you can get my contact details and you can get uh, a copy of my latest book. Thank you very much.